I'd like to welcome you to today's Medical Center Hour on Gun Violence and Mental Illness, Evidence, Solutions. I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities here in the School of Medicine. And I'd like to welcome you all to today's program. Columbine, Virginia Tech, Fort Hood, Huntsville, Tucson, Aurora, Newtown, the Navy Yard, Charleston, Roseburg. Gun violence, including a relentless raft of mass shootings, is epidemic today in the U.S., threatening individual and community safety and public health and well-being. The grim tally for 2015, says the Washington Post, is 294 mass shootings in 274 days. That was last week. The list is much, much longer if we factor in the shooting incidents that take fewer than four lives. The sites of these shootings are places where we go daily, routinely, just living our lives. School, church, a movie theater, a shopping mall. Many shooters are said to have undiagnosed or undertreated mental health problems in their background. How does psychopathology contribute to violent behavior, particularly that involving firearms over a person's life course and in the social environment? How accurate and useful are clinicians' predictions of violence in their patients? What is an appropriate role for clinicians as gun gatekeepers and for mental health services in general as part of a public health solution to gun violence? In this Medical Center, our Duke University professor, Jeffrey Swanson, will review with us research related to these urgent questions. And then he and UVA's Richard Bonney will explore implications for clinicians and other mental health stakeholders. Medical sociologist Jeffrey Swanson, on my immediate right, is professor of psychiatry and behavioral science at Duke University School of Medicine. He's a nationally recognized expert on this rather relentlessly current subject of mass gun violence by shooters whose mental health is in question. Richard Bonney, on my far right, is the Harrison Professor of Law and Medicine here at UVA. He is also the longtime director of the university's Institute for Law, Psychiatry, and Public Policy. He also had a central role in the Commonwealth's investigations and recommendations following the Virginia Tech shooting in 2007. A big thank you to the Institute for Law, Public, Law Psychiatry, and Public Policy and the School of Law for co-sponsoring this program. I direct your attention in the handout also to the announcement of Professor Swanson's talk at 4.30 this afternoon in the Kaplan Pavilion at the Law School. This P. Browning Hoffman lecture in Law and Psychiatry focuses on keeping guns out of the hands of persons deemed risky and on keeping faith with the Second Amendment, a delicate balance, to be sure, but one that interests us all intensely these days. So um, there is some overflow seating if there are some folks standing in the back um, in another room across the way. We'll hear from both Professor Swanson and Professor Bonnie, and then we'll hear from you. Welcome. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for coming. It's a real privilege to be invited to come and speak to you today about this timely topic of gun violence and mental illness. How do we understand it? What can we do about it? And for the next hour, I'd like to invite you to join me as we try to think carefully about this problem of firearms-related injury and mortality and mental illness, what those things have to do with each other, how they're not necessarily related, uh, what we know about that scientifically, what we don't know, and maybe just as importantly, uh, what we think we know sometimes that ain't so, and how we might use that kind of understanding to find our way to some interventions and policies and laws that might actually help us to reduce uh, this uh, a terrible uh, problem, the scourge of gun violence in the United States, but to do that in a way that will balance risk and rights uh, with respect to access to firearms and will also avoid just adding to the terrible burden of social rejection and stigma that people with mental illnesses often face here in our country. Uh, so before I begin, um, I'd like to just take a moment in passing to remember 
the ten lives lost. Uh, given the timeliness of this moment and the recency of the news from Oregon, I'm going to pre be presenting with you to you uh, lots of numbers and statistics, but I want you to keep in mind, as, as I try to do, that every one of those numbers is a human life, a human story, uh, cut short with family members and loved ones left behind, a tragedy in its own right, and a tragedy that reverberates through families and communities in our nation over the generations uh, and decades. And I'd also like us to remember the 92 other people who died as a result of a gunshot in the United States on the same day, October 1st, 2015, as the result of suicides and domestic violence incidents and gang shootings. We didn't hear about them. Uh, we didn't uh, read about them. But 92 people died on that day, and 92 the next day, and the day after that. This is a complicated uh, topic, and what we are really dealing with and, and thinking about today are two very complicated, very important, and very different public health problems. On the one hand, we have mental illness, untreated mental illness in the community, um, and uh, in my view, the mental health care system, if you can call it that here in the United States, uh, is, is broken, it's fragmented, it's under-resourced, it's overburdened. Um, it doesn't work very well for lots of people. Um, as a result, arguably, we have uh, millions of people with serious and disabling mental health conditions out in the community not receiving any treatment. We have more people with serious mental illnesses in our big city jails on any given day than we ever had the largest asylum in the middle of the 20th century. We have people waiting in emergency departments for days sometimes because we don't have a bed. And I think that's a scandal. It's a problem that costs our society $318 billion a year. As a mental health services and policy researcher, I would like nothing more than to take the evidence I've been working to produce and improve the mental health care system. But I'm under no illusion that if we did that, that we would solve the other problem, the problem that you see on the right, which is firearms-related injury and mortality. That's a problem that claims 34,000 lives every year, 81,000 non-fatal injuries. It costs our society $174 billion a year. Now, there's a little intersection. Those two problems come together on their edges. There's a little wedge there where they come together. When do we pay attention to that? We pay attention to that when there's a horrifying mass casualty shooting by a troubled young man. And that little wedge becomes a prism through which we view both of these problems. And in my view, it distorts our view of both of them. Because the mass casualty shooter is atypical, really atypical, of people with mental illnesses, the vast majority of whom are not violent and never will be, and really atypical of the perpetrators of gun crimes, most of whom do not have mental illness. But that's the conversation that we end up having at a day on a day like today. We hear prominent voices in the public square that tell us that the problem with gun violence is mental illness. And in order to fix Gun violence, we need to fix the mental health care system. Representative Tim Murphy, who's sponsoring uh, legislation in Congress to reform the mental health care system in various ways, makes this link explicitly. He said that recently there was Elliot Roger in Santa Barbara, Jared Loftner in Tucson, James Holmes in Aurora, Colorado, and Aaron Alexis at the Washington Navy Yard. How many more must die before we finally deal with our broken mental health system? That's the kind of master explanation for it. Well, you might think that Tim Murphy is one voice on a particular uh, end of the political spectrum. He has an A-plus rating from the NRA, and maybe he wants to talk about mental illness instead of guns. But here's our mainstream journalist, Joe Klein, who wrote after the Sandy Hook shooting, I'm worried about what happens if Congress passes background checks because it doesn't address the most significant piece of the problem, the mental health issue. That's what Joe Klein said. And the public agrees. There was a public opinion poll in 2013 that posed the following question. Do you favor or oppose increasing government spending on mental health screening and treatment as a strategy to reduce gun violence? 60% of the general public said yes. And guess what? 62% of NRA members said the same thing. Now, this is pretty remarkable because if you pose a poll question and you begin it with 
Do you favor or oppose increasing government spending? That's how you started? You're going to lose about half the audience right there, no matter how you finish the statement. But nevertheless, this is one where people said yes. About 60% of the public, uh, of the adults in this population in our country, believe that people with schizophrenia are likely or very likely to be violent. Now, why does that matter? Well, first of all, it turns out to be wrong. But it's also important because people act on the basis of what they believe to be true. And if you believe that people with mental illnesses are dangerous, you might reject them. And you might treat them with scorn. And you might support public policies that restrict their liberties. And you might, in the end, discriminate against them in the distribution of the benefits and rights and opportunities in our society. Just imagine if you came from outer space and you learned everything you knew about schizophrenia by watching television in this country. All you knew was that. Watching nighttime crime drivers, you would think that every single person with schizophrenia is a homicidal monster. That's what you think. And it turns out that that's uh, really disconnected with the science because when you look at the epidemiology of violent behavior and mental illness, we've known for decades that the vast majority of people with mental illnesses are not violent. The absolute risk, people with serious mental illnesses that impair reasoning and judgment and uh, actually, uh, uh, and mood regulation, uh, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, if you factor out substance abuse, which is an issue, about 7% will do something violent in a year. And that could be something as minor as pushing or shoving or slapping somebody. If you want to talk about what people are worried about, which is homicide against a stranger, that is a very small legal in a huge haystack. Now, the relative risk is significant, three point times, three point times more likely to commit some violent act than the general public if you have one of those illnesses. But the attributable risk is 4%. That's the proportion of all violence that's caused by or attributable to mental illness. And people with serious mental illnesses are actually far more likely to be victims of violence than they are perpetrators. So that big circle there is all the violence out there in society. The orange wedge, that little orange wedge, is the proportion of it that's attributable to serious mental illnesses. Which means if we magically cured schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and depression, that would be wonderful, but our violence problem would go down by about 4% and 96% of it would still be with us. All the rest of it is attributable to other things, like being young and male and being impulsively angry and, and having problems like when you're growing up and, and forming a personality, you're being victimized and beat up, and then you grow up and can become a perpetrator. Being exposed to violence in the social environment, those are the things that account for the rest of it. Although, you know, I must say, violent behavior is complicated, and if we put all the variables we have together, we still come up short from explaining it. That's what makes it so difficult to uh, predict and prevent. Now, there are times in the career uh, of illness and treatment of people with serious mental illnesses where we know that risk is elevated uh, because of the way people select into treatment settings. So what you see here, these bars uh, estimate uh, the average prevalence of mental illness in all of these studies that have been done, it's a meta-analysis organized by the settings in which the studies have been done. So for comparison, we have the general population over there on the left. That's 2% in a year would do something violent against another person. Outpatients in treatment. These people have mental illness. They're in treatment. It's a little higher, 8%. Now when we move to the right of the graph and start to look at studies that have been done in the settings in which people encounter the mental health care system in a crisis, like in an emergency department, the rates are higher. 23% uh, for people who present in EDs, and maybe that's why they're brought into the emergency department, because there's a concern with uh, risk to harm, uh, of harm to self or others. Involuntarily committed patients, that's 36%. In the ramp up, in the lead up to an involuntary commitment, that's not surprising either, because the criteria for involuntary commitment are intertwined with uh, violence and dangerousness. And first episode psychosis patients, 37%. Now that's interesting from a policy point of view, because if our way of trying to restrict access to firearms for someone who might be in a mental health crisis is to comb through records and look for red flags, and they're not even in the system, that's not going to work very well. We're going to need another approach. What about gun-related violence and people with mental illness? There, there, here are some data from a new analysis of the MacArthur a violence risk assessment study uh, uh, co-authored by Professor John Monaghan here at UVA, as, uh, among others, uh, uh, and uh, Henry Stedman. What you see here uh, are the results 
of a study that followed up about a thousand patients who had been admitted during an acute psychiatric episode. These are acute hospital admissions. So they don't represent all people out there in the community with mental illness. These are, these are acute inpatients, and then they're discharged and followed for a year, and the results are how many of them were violent. So 28%, or 262 out of that uh, 951, did something, some violent act, minor or serious violent act, over the year. Now, if you, if you take that and then unpack it, it turns out that 23 uh, people used a firearm uh, to commit a violent act or threaten someone with an act. That's a 9%. And then if you unpack that, it turns out that nine individuals used a firearm against a stranger. So you have 1,000 people approximately, and out of that group, 2% of the total sample would do something with a firearm that, was, uh, that would qualify as a violent act. It doesn't mean they shot somebody necessarily, but it means they used a gun. So the absolute risk is low. Now that's about three times higher than the rate in the general public so this is an example where you know it's you can two things sound like they're paradoxical. One is someone is three times more likely to do something, but the vast majority of people who have the risk factor are not going to do it. That's the problem with the risk factors for violence, as we'll see. They apply; they're non-specific. They apply to many, many more people who are not going to do it than who do, and uh, that 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 poses a real problem for policy if your strategy is to try to find that one person. So let's look at these 23 individuals, these 23 MacArthur uh, study patients who were discharged and did something violent with a gun. Who were they? Well, they were young males. All of them were young males. It turns out that uh, they had, as the authors of the study put, put it, uh, a lot of uh, prior involvement with both the mental health and the criminal justice system. They were well known to both of those systems. 78.3% had a prior hospitalization and over half had more than three admissions. 91% had a prior arrest, and 52% had more than three arrests. So these are people in both of these systems. Let's look at potential criminogenic factors. It turns out 91% of them had been physically abused as a child. That's a huge risk factor. I could present a number of studies that show that that is a big risk factor for, for adult involvement in violent behavior. 65% had a father who had more than two arrests. So justice involved parents, that's another risk factor. That doesn't necessarily explain things, but if you just want to predict, this, these are variables that are important. And substance abuse is huge. That actually, if we, if we could do one thing, I would say focus on substance abuse, because that um, has lots of ways in which it increases violent behavior, both pharmacologically and in terms of exacerbating psychiatric symptoms like excessive threat perception, and in terms of involving people with social environments that are toxic, Ill illegal drug markets, and so on. Finally, psychiatric factors. Well, suicide threats, 65% had made suicide threats, but only 21.7% had hallucinations, and 13.0% had paranoid symptoms. So, What's interesting to me about that is the paranoid symptoms, that's the stereotype that people think about when we think of mental illness and violence. What about mass shootings? Well, here's just one study among others that profiles. Troubled young man, here's 34 males who killed at least three people in a single event. This is Reed Malloy's study. Uh, um, and you know, it turns out 70% of them were described as a loner. 61.5% uh, had substance abuse problems, about half were preoccupied with weapons, half were, uh, half or so had violent fantasies, 43.5% had uh, been a victim of bullying, only 23.3% had a documented psychiatric history, and 6% were psychotic at the time. Now, we could, we could describe and profile a mass shooter by saying, this is the picture of the person. It's an alienated, troubled, isolated young man. The problem with that is it also describes tens of thousands of other alienated young men who are never going to do this, and we can't just round them all up. Uh, so that is, that is part of the problem, what I mean by uh, nonspecific risk factors. So does mental illness cause violence? I mean, that's the question, isn't it? And I can tell you the answer. I'm a professor. I study this. The answer is it depends. Um, it depends. If we mean this, if mental illness then violence, like a chemical reaction that you could you know, express in a mathematical equation, the answer is no. Because there's just too many people who are violent and aren't mentally ill. And there's too many people who are mentally ill and are not violent. But maybe it's something more like this, like these dominoes here. 
this complicated causal system with all of these upstream precursors that can be in the genetically inherited, inheritable environment, they can be in the social environment, your personality, uh, access to means, mediators like substance abuse, and they're all tumbling all over. It doesn't mean that the dominoes are going to fall every time. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. And sometimes when people with mental illness commit a violent act, that's not why. I mean, maybe it's because they had a horrible childhood, and now they're living in a terrible neighborhood and hanging out with unsavory characters. Um, so it is complicated, and there's a lot of uncertainty. So can we predict violent behavior? Can we predict mass shootings? Well, sure you can. I can do that too, and you can as well. All you need is this remarkable device called a retrospectoscope. <laughs> it's just amazing what you can see through this thing, okay? It's incredible. Now, the trouble starts when you flip it over and point it out into the future, and then it all turns to fog. And even trained psychiatrists using structured risk assessment instruments, the best risk assessment technology we have, it's no better than a coin toss. I mean, if you, they predict the patient's going to be violent, that's about what the odds are. Now, they're a lot better at ruling out who is not going to be violent. But this is really, really difficult. So how does this translate into our policy solutions? Well, you know, uh, unfortunately or not, depending on your position on this, we can't do what some of our peer countries in Western Europe do, which is to broadly limit legal access to guns. Because the Second Amendment to the Constitution, as interpreted by the United States Supreme Court, says that we can't do that. Guns are here, guns are here to stay. So we have to do something different, which is to try to identify who are the people who are so risky, pose such a risk to themselves or others, that they should, be, they should have their gun rights abridged. Well, federal law, this is inherited from the 1968 Gun Control Act. That was the year that uh, Senator Bobby Kennedy and uh, Dr. Martin Luther King were assassinated with firearms. Um, this, this law, and it's, in, it's codified in the federal code, excludes some people with mental illness from accessing a firearm. It's based on the history of mental health adjudication. So uh, are prohibited from purchasing or possessing a firearm so if you've been committed to a mental institution or, and here's this a really terrible, infelicitous phrase, adjudicated as a mental defective. Nobody likes this. It doesn't mean anything clinically. What it means legally is that there's been a legal authority that has determined that a person is dangerous or incompetent to manage their own affairs due to a mental illness or in a criminal matter that they're incompetent to stand trial uh, or uh, acquitted by reason of insanity. Now, if you ask people out in the general public, what are these laws for? They'll say, well, it's to keep people like this from getting guns. Jared Lofter and uh, James Holmes and Adam Lanza and Cho from Virginia Tech. The problem with that idea is that the people with mental illness actually look like this. Like everybody in this room, people with mental illness are people. They have all the same risk and protective factors as you or I do. And they range from your harmless grandmother to your neighbor's not so harmless intoxicated boyfriend and everything in between. So that's what makes it difficult. So involuntary commitment as a standard, it has some pros and cons. Uh, it, it identifies a lot of people who are not violent. Here's just one example. This is a study we did in, in North Carolina, 331 people who had been involuntarily committed. Well, it turns out that um, of that group, 33% uh, of them had made no threats or violent acts at all. 17% yeah, had made verbal threats but hadn't done anything violent. 32% had committed an act that might be sort of like simple battery, like maybe punching somebody in the nose or pushing somebody without using a weapon and not causing injury. And 18% of these involuntarily committed people in the history before they were committed had committed a serious violent act and they injured somebody or they used a weapon. Now you unpack that 18%, and that's interesting too. So two thirds of that group, or 13% of the total, had a weapon in hand, but they didn't cause an injury. And uh, 14% or 2% of the total had uh, caused an injury but without using a weapon. And 20% or 3% of that total of involuntarily committed patients had uh, caused an injury to someone using a weapon. It's also true that a lot of high-risk people out there are not captured by the existing criteria. So there are dangerous people who are never going to get involuntarily committed. We did a study last year that looked for the entire nation with the Psychiatric Epidemiological Survey and a collaboration with Ron Kessler at Harvard at the conjunction of two things, impulsive, angry behavior and access to firearms. These are the kinds of people who, when they get angry, they break and smash things and get into physical fights. Everybody gets angry. When I get angry, it's called uh, uh, 
Um, righteous indignation, but uh, <laughs> so it's a normal emotion. But this is anger that's extreme, that is destructive, that's um, that is unpredicted, and it's uh, when when you combine that with access to firearms, I think that's a bad combination. That's nine percent of the adult population, and one point four percent have impulsive, angry behavior, pathological anger, and are carrying a gun around with them. Now, here's what's interesting. These people have lots of mental health problems. They meet criteria for all kinds of psychopathology. It's not schizophrenia and stuff like that. What it is is personality disorders. It's fear and anxiety and it's alcohol problems. It's these kinds of things. It's not what you get involuntarily committed for. So only, uh, well, under 10% of those individuals have ever been in a hospital for a mental health problem. So they're not going to get involuntarily committed. Now, there might be other ways of thinking about them. They might have misdemeanor assault charges, right? In many states, those that do not confer loss of firearms rights, maybe they should. In California, they do. And they have a lower uh, problem with gun violence than many other states. So if you think about it, there are three circles that come together. They overlap. They're not isomorphic. Suicidality, interpersonal violence, mental illness. And this is what our gun restriction criteria uh, does that dotted circle there? It's both over inclusive and under inclusive at the same time. It's too broad and it's too narrow. It identifies lots of people who aren't dangerous and they never will be. They got committed 20 years ago with a suicidal episode. They're fine now and they're you know they want to get a job as a security guard and they can't because they're prohibited from firearms. And if there's tons of people who are violent and dangerous and are suicidal and are never going to get uh, identified by this. So do background checks work? What do we know about this? Well, we did a study uh, in Connecticut uh, last year. It's part of a multi-site study. We've done the same analysis in Florida and hope to do it here in Virginia as well. What you see here are two trend lines. These are 23,000 uh, uh, patients with serious mental illnesses. They are participants in the public behavioral health system in Connecticut. They have schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or depression. They've all been hospitalized. The red line, think of this as, as a... This is violent crime month by month by month, the probability that's estimated by this statistical equation. The red line are people who can't buy a gun legally because they have a, a, a gun disqualifying mental health adjudication. We've taken out the people with criminal records so we can just focus on the impact of this policy. The blue line are their counterparts, same illnesses, same mental health system. They've all been hospitalized, but they were hospitalized voluntarily. And so they are not prohibited from buying a gun. And you can see before about 2007, the red line is higher, which you would expect if the law is not being enforced very well. If people can go in to try to buy a gun and they can lie and buy, as our friend Phil Cook says. But after 2007, what happened? The lines come together, what happened there? Well, that's when Connecticut deposited thousands of these gun disqualifying records into the national it's a check system. So the lines come together. Well, you might look at that and say, that worked, that's a, that's, that's a success story. Well, here's another way of looking at it. it only 7% of the population here was disqualified by a mental health adjudication because Connecticut doesn't do very much commitment, and states vary on that. And 96% of the violent crime among people with serious mental illnesses was, was committed by people who aren't disqualified. So all of the crime is happening outside of that prohibitor, uh, basically. And what... Guess what? The factors that are most strongly associated with violent crime in this group, being young and male and disadvantaged and misusing drugs and alcohol, not having a whole lot to do with the stuff that people get committed for. So it's like if you had an infectious disease and you came up with this wonderful vaccine, but you only vaccinated 7% of the population. And meanwhile, there are lots of other vectors that cause the same illness and you're not addressing them at all. Our study in Florida, which is not published yet, uh, has some very, very interesting data. What you're looking at here, this pie chart represents 50 people. Again, think of this as 50 lives who ended their own uh, days on Earth here with a firearm. Now, it turns out that 72% of them, on the day that they used the gun to end their life, could legally walk in and buy a gun. They were not prohibited from doing that, and that's what many of them did. They would pass a background check with flying colors. That's a problem with our criteria. If we had a better crystal ball, we could know who's going to do that. We could prohibit them and say you can't buy a gun. Here's the other problem. 28% of them already were legally not able to buy a gun, and they got one anyway. They had one anyway. It didn't stop them. That's a problem with the enforcement, the implementation of the laws that we have. Over here, this pie chart is the same analysis, but it's people arrested for a violent crime with a gun. 38% of them were not gun prohibited. 62%, just about two-thirds who committed a violent crime with a gun, weren't legally allowed to have a gun when they did it. That's a problem that has a lot of uh, you know, reasons for it. One is that it's too easy to get a gun outside of the 
system of going into a federally licensed dealer and passing a background check. And people can get guns on the secondary market, on the illegal market, and enforcement of, of, of gun trafficking and legal guns is a big part of this problem, and having universal background checks is another one. But here's a little silver lining policy-wise. Florida has changed its law, and we haven't looked at this yet, but it, it turns out that among those people who committed suicide with a gun, a whole bunch of them actually had had an involuntary short-term hold that didn't progress to a disqualifying commitment, but the system knew they were in a mental health crisis. They just signed in voluntarily or were discharged early. What if those uh, short-term holds had conferred a loss of gun rights, temporarily, let's say, within a judicial hearing to determine if people could have their gun rights back? Some of those people might have been saved. Suicide actually is a huge public health opportunity. Here's the reason. Uh, it's much more related to mental illness, for one thing. So it would have a big impact if we provided better screening and treatment for mental illness. It would do way more to solve the suicide problem. It, you know, and we could probably reduce gun violence a lot if we provided better mental health treatment. But it would 95% of the reduction would be from reducing suicide, not homicide. So you know, 50 to 75% of suicides are attributable to mental illness. Now here's another issue. So if people try to harm themselves with a gun, intentional self-injury, and they use anything but a gun. On average, this is what happened. 5% of them live, 95% of them survive. Here's what happens if you try it with a gun. 84% die and 16% survive. The case fatality rate is so high that people don't get that second chance. And the second chance is what's important with suicide, because people who survive suicide attempts do not go on to die from suicide. Typically, they don't. So, you know, it's, it is the classic, as they say, uh, permanent solution to a temporary problem. And it's personal for me, too. I had a 19-year-old cousin who ended her life with a firearm as a, as a college freshman. And I think about her and my uncle and aunt all the time when I think about this. And uh, she, uh, she was uh, legally sold a firearm, which she used for the purpose of ending her life. Well. If you think about this, if we could do nothing else, if we could do nothing except just change the means that people use when they uh, intentionally harm themselves, you can extrapolate from the CDC data. And it looks like this. Just nudging down a little bit the proportion of people who use a gun versus some other means, we could probably save 55,000 lives. And this is just an example over 10 years of how we could do that. So the key questions are, how do we identify dangerous people? That's really hard to do, as I've said. If we knew who they were, how do we practically limit gun access for people identified as dangerous? That's also hard to do in our country, in our policy context. And then how do we do that without you know, infringing on the rights of people, uh, lawful gun owners, the privacy of psychiatric patients, and the autonomy and judgment of healthcare professionals? Sometimes what you get is a, what I call a crisis-driven law, a crisis-driven crisis uh, you know, policy, where you know the, the policy makers want to do something and jump out of the starting gates and go do something and they overcorrect and they don't think about the unintended adverse consequences. This is what happened in New York. After the Sandy Hook shooting, Governor Cuomo and the New York State, New York State Legislature passed the New York Secure Ammunition and Firearms Enforcement Act, called the New York SAFE Act, a lovely acronym. And it did some things that gun violence prevention experts would applaud. You know, and there were universal background checks, it beefed up enforcement of illegal gun trafficking and with higher penalties, it banned assault weapons and high capacity ammunition magazines. And then it, they did this. While we're at it, why don't we de reach into mental health territory and why don't we en enlist the mental health workforce as a surveillance network to identify risky people and require that those mental health professionals report those risky patients to the police so that their names can be matched to the gun registry and they can be prohibited from firearms. So that, you know, imagine a college student who you know, gets enough courage to go in and see a counselor on campus because she is feeling like my cousin felt. And then her name is reported to the police and this gets around. You think that might inhibit people's help seeking or their disclosures to their therapists, and that's something people didn't think about too much. And then expand involuntary outpatient commitment. Let's do that too. It's interesting when you have a law that does all of these different things, you get some uh, strange bedfellows. So a bunch of people didn't like it. The psychiatrists, the social workers, the nurses, the mental health uh, advocates, they didn't like it. Well, neither did the NRA or the sheriffs or the veterans. Okay? I mean, people didn't like it for different reasons. 
you know, the strange bedfellows. I don't mean any disrespect to kittens and dogs here, but, uh, uh, you know, the kitten said it criminalizes mental illness and it will have a chilling effect on help seeking, and the dog said it violates the Second Amendment to the Constitution. So I don't know what the solution is specifically for every single state. There are some principles, I think, that in our country we need to think about. One is we need to prioritize contemporaneous risk assessment, which is based on behaviors they correlate with violence and self-harm at specific times, not mental illness broadly as a category. This is about risk. Let's have it be about risk. And there are ways we can do that. Uh, number two, we need to do something about preempting existing gun access. If all we do is stop somebody from buying a new gun, they have 10 at home already, that is not going to solve this problem. And there are innovative legal solutions, preemptive gun seizure laws that put a legal tool in the hands of family members and law enforcement, and there's someone that they know who is disturbed, who is suicidal, that guns can be taken away from that person for their own safety and the safety of the public. Number three, there's a constitutional right at stake. We need to provide legal due process for the deprivation of gun rights. Five, preserve confidential therapeutic relationships. If we're going to think about the role of physicians as gun gatekeepers, we need to recognize that confidentiality is the bedrock of the doctor-patient relationship. The clinicians already have a number of tools that they can use in risk assessment and risk management. We need to think very carefully about that. I mean, doctors are now in a position where, like in North Carolina, you might get a letter from the sheriff saying, here's a person who's applied for a concealed carry uh, permit. Uh, do they suffer from any mental or physical condition that would uh, render them unable to safely operate a handgun? Well, what does that mean? What does competence to operate a handgun mean? Doctors don't know, and neither do the rest of us. Uh, so then I think, that, you know, we're never going to find that needle in the haystack, but we need to do what I call prevent the unpredicted. And that is get upstream and try to address some of the social determinants of violent behavior. Have healthier communities with fewer kids who are exposed to trauma who grow up to be perpetrators, a better social safety net, better access to substance abuse treatment, take some of the money we're using in interdiction and locking up a whole generation of people and put it into community care where you can give people better access to treatment. Um, and, you know, if we did all of those things, I think it would make a difference. It's not a one-thing problem or a one-thing solution. Here are some recommendations very specifically from our Consortium for Risk-Based Firearms Policy. We have a group that uh, constituted by researchers and some, uh, some policy people. Um, one is to, to think about the criteria for gun prohibition and make that more accurate. There are, there are indicators of risk that currently do not result in disqualification in many uh, states, and they include violent misdemeanor convictions, to, uh, temporary domestic violence restraining orders. Uh, sometimes people in the ex parte temporary phase of that can keep their gun, and in many states they don't. That's a high-risk time, and that's an opportunity uh, for public safety. Uh, correlates of uh, violence, such as DUIs or, D, or DWIs, uh, drug, illicit drug uh, convictions, and then the mental health one that I mentioned, uh, short-term and voluntary hospitalization. Also, make this expanded disqualification contingent on having a restoration process that's meaningful, that's expedient, that's clinically informed so that people can get their gun rights back. If we do that, we will find that there is a large uh, swath of common real estate between people who disagree on the politics of gun control, but they don't disagree that really dangerous people shouldn't have their hands on a gun. And if we can actually say, we recognize that, and we're also just as concerned about gun rights restoration, I think we're going to have a better conversation. And then enact dangerous persons preemptive gun removal laws. In Connecticut and Indiana, where those laws have gone into effect for several years, they're, they're increasing, and they're used often for suicide concerns. Now, just to end here, all of you have been to our National Mall, and you've seen the Vietnam Memorial, and you know what a sobering sight it is to see 58,000 names carved in the granite wall. That's the number of people, United States military personnel who died in the Vietnam the conflict over 10 years. If we were to build a monument to commemorate all the people who died as a result of a gunshot in this country in the last 10 years, we'd need a monument five times larger than the Vietnam Memorial. 306,946 people. And here are three of them. These are the students in Chapel Hill who were shot by the angry man. People knew he was angry. People knew he had guns. Nobody could do anything about it. The public supports sensible laws and policies. We don't have to wait until we understand the inner workings of the brain. If we just want to stop so many people from dying, we could do these things. There's not going to be a big headline in the New York Times that says, better background checks, 
a better social safety net, um, and um, you know, uh, a, a few other things actually prevented mayhem today. But if we did that, why would that matter? Thank you very much. Well, uh, the first thing I want to say is thanks to Jeff uh, for coming to Charlottesville. Um, second thing I'll say is I am in awe of Jeff. <laughs> I think all of you are. It's just extraordinary. Um, and it's important that he's so good at this because we need him everywhere, right? I, I think that he has taken this very complicated problem set of problems, really, in some ways, different problems, and given us a context and perspective on it that is really just shows the grasp that he has of the behavioral sciences, you know, uh, from the individual level, of course, to the, he's a soci trained sociologist. Um, and not only to describe the problem, but to help us think about how to connect the dots between what he understands about the problem and conveys so successfully, you know, to us and what to do about it. Uh, and of course, I'm always in awe of the graphics, you know. <laughs> I just wish I could do that. Um, and uh, then, um, so the challenge is to promote this level of understanding among the people who are in positions to make policy about this. And again, that's why I'm so happy that he's come here and why I put him to work so much, right? So we have this, we have a law school uh, event this afternoon. Um, we have a uh, 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 presentation at the Batten School on uh, public policy and leadership to, tomorrow. Um, and as many media interviews as he can fit in, uh, because uh, we just need to get help people understand this problem and to think about what we can do about it even in a way that's completely consistent, you know, with, uh, with the Second Amendment. So again, in this area, as in so many, the challenge is, so how can we find the common ground here? And I think we can, actually. Um, Jeff and I have been working on this for a long time, um, and you mentioned the consortium uh, on risk-based uh, firearm policies, uh, as it's called, and that idea was carefully chosen, right? If we can get people to think about the evidence about what we know and think about risk and reducing risk, um, we might be able to get beyond the sound bites that have kind of been displayed on some of those early slides and think about what we can really do uh, and come up with some solutions that are really targeted. And there's plenty of room for, for improvement, right? I mean, even within the constraints uh, of, the, uh, of the Second Amendment. So, um, let me just uh, highlight a couple of the points that he said, and then I do want to make a couple of uh, policy uh, uh, observations. So first of all, and when we're thinking about what, what to do, um, he demonstrated the complete mismatch, not complete, large, substantial area of mismatch between the policies that we now uh, have in place. Even selected, po even policies that are respectful of the First Amendment, excuse me, the Second Amendment, First Amendment also. Um, but um, uh, and that begin with the presumption that all of us individually have a right, presumptively, uh, to own and, and, and use firearms. But obviously, there are going to be some subset of people should be disqualified from, and even, of course, the uh, gun rights constituencies understand that. So we're trying to figure out, okay, so what are the types of interventions that could be taken, and what are the criteria that need to be satisfied? And there's a lot of room for improvement even 
Um, but we need to do the research. So I think that's kind of the main uh, implication here, here, as he kind of went through what we know, um, that there are a lot of things we still do not know, and the things that we are beginning to find out is a body of research to which Jeff has substantially contributed over the last several years, right? The general background epidemiological presentations that he made, these are things that he's been working, you know, for decades, as with John, John Monahan has. So we know that the, um, much of that. But what we need to know in order to be able to think about firearm policy is still got huge gaps uh, in it. So I think if we can get people to think about the importance of research and not view research and the argument for research as uh, being um, uh, part of the, the rhetoric about gun, about gun policy, which is what it is now. And you know, one of the, the big you know, fighting issues here is that uh, uh, because of concerns that the gun rights community had about the bias, as they saw it, of public health law, uh, public health research uh, into gun policy, that the CDC has been substantially limited in carrying out firearm-related research as part of the, national, the work of the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control. But that needs to stop. I mean, we need to, you know, to say we need that all of us, whatever side of this debate we are on in terms of basic political instincts, we need to know more about the relationship between uh, mental illness and violence and what the causes of firearm <laughs> policy and uh, uh, firearm uh, deaths are by suicide or homicide. We need to know more, and we need to know more about the effects of different interventions. Um, and we are only beginning to, I think, explore uh, that, uh, that territory. Um, also, uh, he emphasized that the, um, there is, uh, with regard to the disqual disqualifying criteria now, the focus is on civil commitment felony uh, convictions and, and uh, uh, certain uh, domestic violence misdemeanors as a gun prohibitor. But uh, uh, as uh, uh, people with histories of civil commitment, but he's already you know, demonstrated that the civil commitment criteria is way over broad. Um, uh, and we need to, to tweak it in order to be able to make it uh, more uh, targeted on the people that you know, are at elevated risk. But we need to think about what the factors are that elevate risk for people that do not have uh, serious mental illness and have not been civilly committed and will never be civilly committed. And that is also a major uh, uh, area of research that the consortium is trying to promote. Uh, uh, and also the, uh, to identify uh, the criteria that really would focus on such matters as impulsive, uh, angry uh, behavior. Um, finally, uh, with regard to the, uh, the actual recommendations, so um, uh, Jeff outlined some principles, and um, so I want to reinforce a couple of things that he said and then just add a couple of uh, uh, additional uh, ideas. So we need to develop specific legal tools that focus on uh, the time that people demonstrate elevated risk. And if you would think about uh, some of the instances that we are uh, aware of, just to pick a couple of them. So uh, there was the, the uh, incident recently in Roanoke um, uh, where the two uh, broadcasters or the cameraman and the broad broadcast uh, person from the uh, the, the NPR station were shot in the, in the shopping mall by a person uh, who had been um, discharged, uh, fired from the, the station, and obviously was carrying around this anger for a very long period of time. Um, and there was a particular incident when, uh, after he was discharged, where he exhibited threatening, highly threatening behavior, um, and some of that behavior may or may not have been punishable, but whether it did or not, it certainly demonstrated elevated risk for violence. And if there had been a, uh, a law in effect then, or maybe in some other uh, incident that he might have engaged in that we don't know about you know, at a later time, given the fact that he's been carrying this grudge around for so long, it would have been an occasion, if he had had firearms, to invoke the kind of law that uh, uh, Connecticut and Indiana have, which Jeff, Jeff described in California, just pa passed one as well, very developed by the consortium, for essentially gun violence restraining orders, that if people demonstrate elevated risk by concrete behavior, not specifically necessarily related to mental illness, that any firearms that they have can be removed uh, and based on a judicial determination then, uh, uh, after a period of time, 
that they would not be able to get access to a firearm, uh, you know, for whatever the designated period of time might be under the law. So that is one of the areas where right now there's a couple of states that have these innovations, but they really are worthy of consideration to deal with a lot of these kinds of cases that we are, uh, you know, now concerned about. And again, if you think about some of the other, you know, incidents, the one, of course, in Oregon is, a, is another one, um, where there were acute, somebody had acute evidence. There was also the Navy Yard shooting was another one. Many of them, there is acute evidence where you would be able to get firearms out of the hands of people, at least during the period of, uh, of elevated risk. And it doesn't necessarily depend upon whether they have a serious mental illness or they've had an uh, involuntary uh, hospitalization. So that's an area that we really need to pursue. There was a bill uh, introduced by Senator Barker, uh, tailored to Virginia, uh, based on this basic idea last uh, session of the General Assembly. And I think you'll you begin to hear more about that, not only this upcoming session, but I think uh, in the years ahead. It didn't get out of committee last time, but it's a new idea, and I think Virginia naturally is a conservative state and, you know, interested in, uh, you know, thinking about something instead of adopting it, uh, you know, right, uh, right away. The final thing I want to say is that uh, we have a cultural challenge here, too. Even if you put these uh, tools into effect, these legal tools, people have to be willing to use that. And that implicates the, the, the behavior the expectations uh, and the behavior of all of us who may be, uh, you know, interacting with family members, with friends or acquaintances, and this is particularly true for young people, uh, because many of these people, of course, are young people and they have had roommates or they have other people that have been observing their behavior. Um, indeed, in Dylan Roof's case, there was one of the news reports, this is the, the Charleston case, uh, of one of the uh, friends of his that he was, he was drinking very heavily and saying all these things about, you know, racial hatred and such uh, that, that he had been saying. And the roommate was actually worried about him. He had a gun actually there, uh, and the, the friend surreptitiously removed the gun, you know, for a period of time and then gave it back to him at some point. But there, obviously, you've got somebody that's really worried about someone. And in many of these situations, undoubtedly, that has been the case that there are people, family members, friends, co-workers, that are genuinely worried and concerned. And what we need to do as a cultural matter is to educate and empower people to be able to take some kind of precautionary steps to deal with this. And even in family members, families feel paralyzed. Now, I don't know the case in Chapel Hill that you were talking about what the kind of the, the, the situation might have been, whether there you know some premonitory signs or worries that might have been, you know, led to the possibility of inter intervention. It doesn't necessarily, of course, need to be legal intervention. You have informal opportunities that are also uh, available. But I think people do not know what to do, you know, in our society. And we need to try to help them understand. There's a tremendous effort that's been going on. Uh, it certainly began before Virginia Tech, but was accelerated all over the country after Virginia Tech uh, to encourage students and so on, uh, teachers, you know, to uh, 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 bring to, if they have worries, genuine worries, to take steps to bring them to the attention of people who might be able to do with it, not necessarily in some strong-armed way, uh, through uh, what are uh, called threat assessment teams in, in, in various uh, you know, settings, and they also exist in the workplace. But whatever the interventions are, uh, we need to encourage people to be willing to do that. All right, so that's empowering people to do it. It's not requiring them to do it. But I have to tell you my final observation here is, you know, I mean, maybe I'm just going way beyond what, what I should in a public setting, you know, at this point. But one also wonders where at some point we, uh, people ought to be, feel a moral obligation to do something, right? It's not only, um, you know, we want to help them think that they should, if they feel worried, that they, you know, permitted to take actions and they should be encouraged to do it. But at some point, maybe this should be thought of as a moral obligation. And the thing that I just wonder about is the case in Oregon, where, of course, according to the news accounts, this mother had ongoing interactions with her son, you know, and there have got to have been some points during that period, unless she was in complete denial, which may very well have been the case, that might have suggested elevated risk to her. And maybe she should have done something you know, under these circumstances. Now, again, I don't really mean to kind of use her as a, 
you know, uh, I mean, again, I don't know the circumstances, but it's the idea. Maybe just, uh, just think of it as a reason for asking the question about the cultural change that needs to occur to get people to both recognize these problems, to feel empowered to deal with the problems, and maybe all of us collectively feeling responsible as well. So, turn on. and we have a few minutes to hear from all of you. Um, if you have questions or comments, please wait for a mic to come to you. Um, and uh, please identify yourself when you ask your question as well. Bob Powers with the Department of Medicine. Uh, both of you, or one of you at least mentioned, but you, neither of you addressed the fact that there's a huge male predominance in this, in, in the perpetrators of these mass shootings. Well, what do you make of that and what do we do about it? <laughs> I'm going to give that one to you. <laughs> uh, well, that's a, that's a hard question. Uh, it's obviously uh, not just gun violence, but uh, there's a male predominance in aggressive behavior and criminal offending in general. Uh, I am not going to get into uh, what might be the biological basis for that versus the social basis for it. Um, it, it is true that um, if, if you separate, there's two tasks here. One might be scientifically understanding why violent uh, events happen, and the other might be the task of just trying to prevent so many from happening and predict it. And there, there are things that we, we can use information that we have about risk factors, uh, even if we uh, you know, don't necessarily uh, know the why uh, and everything. But, but that, is, that is certainly true. And uh, if we want to go looking for mass shooters, uh, that's probably where, where to look. But as I've said, all of the risk factors, not just that one, uh, you, you know, you're going to get tens of thousands of people who meet that profile. So what do you do with that information? I think it would be uh, better to better to focus on the kinds of policies that prevent the unpredicted. Correlators, um, Australia did something several years ago that I thought might be applicable to the United States. After a mass killing of 35 people, uh, the uh, president and the Congress passed a law to outlaw automatic and semi-automatic weapons. I've read the Second Amendment many times, and I haven't seen anywhere in there that says you can't limit certain kinds of guns. It seems to me that if we limited or disbanded handguns and automatic weapons, that this would make a big deal. Well, let me just say one word about the Second Amendment question. Even when the Supreme Court uh, recognized that the Second Amendment uh, protected an individual right, um, they did make it clear that they, were, uh, uh, they didn't necessarily say what kinds of weapons you know, people uh, were entitled to possess you know, under the Second Amendment and then the limit, limitations with regard to the particular types of firearms and ammunition you know, might, might be permissible. Um, uh, so there are a lot of uncertainties about what the actual scope of the Second Amendment, you know, are. Uh, so I think that will unfold over time. But I'm I'm confident that there are some legitimate constraints, you know, on the types of weapons that people might might have in a constitutional sense. Now, what we can ha ha accomplish politically, obviously, is another issue. But there may be some empirical aspects of this. Well, I would simply say uh, yes. The, the the type of weapon and the and the destructiveness, the, the the capacity of that technology to kill a large number of people in a short period of time is is important. Um, what's more important is general access to handguns, though, uh, because there's lots of research that shows that there's a strong correlation between access to handguns in general and firearm-related fatalities. We don't have an exceptional crime problem compared to our peer countries. We're just right about in the middle in the uh, prevalence of violent crime. We have an exceptional homicide problem because of the extreme prevalence of, uh, of firearms and easy access to them for people at times when they're inclined to commit a harmful act. So I would think that that should be, that should be the larger emphasis. And uh, the, the, the research actually on the, 
on the impact of assault weapons bans uh, is, is, uh, is, is not terribly clear, although uh, I, you know, I think it's important that it, I wouldn't say that's the, the, you know, the only thing to think about for sure. Uh, for Professor Bond, it is uh, Tom on camera. I work as the crisis intervention team coordinator for the region. And where the Virginia legislation is at, especially with the Senator Deeds and Delegate Bell, do you see any practical changes in the legislation based on Professor Swanson's suggestions of what's happening with mental health and violence? Um, well, I think the technical answer to that is that um, the, uh, uh, the long-term study that Senator Deeds is chairing and, and, and Ron Bell is vice chairing is extremely important on the mental health policy part of what Jeff was describing. Uh, that we really have a, you know, a four-year study underway that really, I think, is uh, uh, going to make yet another effort to come to terms with uh, uh, the, uh, the nature of the services that uh, you know, are supported. Uh, there will be probably some tinkering, uh, you know, with uh, the legal aspects of it, but I think this is really an issue of trying to fill gaps in services and, 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 and to try to correct some of the mismatch in services uh, that now exist. Um, I don't think that they have jurisdiction, essentially, in terms of their charge to deal with these firearms issues. That's really, you know, going to be have to be something that's come before the courts of justice committees and the respective uh, houses. Um, and so I'm not sure there's going to be much connection between that study uh, and, uh, and some of the issues that Jeff uh, has talked about. But at the same time, I think we need to, you know, to be moving forward on that front also. Thank you. I'm afraid that we are out of time, but I would encourage you to um, stop up front with your questions. That is, please join us next week. We have a program.